So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, dealing about cyanonasal malignancy is a difficult task, and I must say that this is my topic is more decision-making in transorbital approaches, so I will not show you any videos and different surgical techniques. So, what I will speak about is the clinical manifestations, some definitions, and also we have to speak about the orbital involvement and the impact on outcome. This is a matter of debate in recent literature, literature as well. Then we will have to speak about the imaging techniques and the reliability of the, such picture, pictures. And frequently we encounter the situation that we cannot really radically resect these tumors. And then what we are going to do is a difficult task as well. Orbital involvement, decision-making, here we have to discuss about the orbital accentuation. Is it still an adequate treatment, yes or no? And then I just would like to, um, let's say, give some recommendation based on our experience. So the vast majority of patients that have cyanonasal malignancy that are infiltrating the, op uh, the optic, they are asymptomatic. Some people have due to proptosis, some severe keratitis, some have double vision, especially if the orbital muscles are involved, a frozen globe, and some have visual, impa uh, visual impairment. And this deterioration is due to, uh, let's say, a most, more extended disease. What you can find is a displacement of the globe, some pa people have, some patients have asymmetric palpable fissure and some also, of course, the proptosis. The proptosis is quite, quite easily in, uh, measurable in the, uh, let's say, in your office with this uh, Hertz Excel thermometer, and you can measure also the, eye, you can check the eyeball movement. Now, it's always wise to have a neuro-ophthalmologist on your side because based on his finding, you, he, you can say, you can estimate where the optical pathway, pathway is compromised. This is for sure the case. And then, as the previous um, speakers already talked about, we have to segregate the different lesions. Is it intraconal? That means it is between the muscles, like in here, in these uh, cases here. Or, and many of them are in close contact with the optic nerve. The vast majority of the cyanonasal malignancy, they are, have a contribution in the extraconal aspect of the, of the orbit, like in here, like in this cyanonasal indifferentiated carcinoma, and this snuck under, or let's say here is a recurrence of a squamous cell carcinoma, you can see the muscles are clearly respected up to this point here in the superior oblique muscle. But this patient was as asymptomatic. And some few have mixed extraconal and intraconal lesions. You can see here the muscular superior rectus and the lateral rectus as well. Now, there's a matter of debate in the literature about the um, outcome. And this means that we know that as soon as the medial and inferior wall, for instance, in adenocarcinoma are involved, by definition, this is a T3 stage. A T3 stage means that the outcome is much worse in contrast to the T1 and T2. So shall we go for an orbital accentuation in these cases? But this means we have to sacrifice one eye. We cause a lot of cosmetic disturbance, although that it is perfectly uh, made here. But on the donor side, you have this defect. For the flat brick construction, you need some full, uh, skin grafting and so on. And imagine this is a young patient, and this contributes to, a, let's say, a significant impact on the quality of life. Now, this is to me an interesting study that has been performed only on 66 patients. You see squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. And you see orbital accentuation does not significantly contribute to a better outcome. 
So this is quite interesting. So we have to think twice whether we are going to sacrifice the orbit. Sac the problem is when can we dis decide to discuss about, let's say, a um, orbital accentuation. For that reason, we need, for these purposes, we need imaging of good qualities. Of course, CT can be uh, provide ex excellent information on the bone. MRI in contrast for, let's say, for the infiltration of the dura. Here another example for rhabdomyosarcoma. You see here the CT scan that is involving a little bit the lateral aspect of the, of the orbit here. Uh, but it is here on the MRI, you can clearly see on the same patient that there is an involvement of the periorbit minimum, eventually in close contact to the lateral uh, rectus muscle. So, shall we go for um, an orbital accentuation? Sometimes we are in a crucial situation that we cannot really distinguish whether the orbit is really infiltrated. From adenoid cystic carcinoma, we know they long, for a long period of time, they respect the orbit and the dura as well. And this was the case in this patient as well. So we only had to strip off a little bit of the uh, periorbit in order to have um, clear margins on one hand, and secondly also to have an information whether the periorbit is infiltrated, yes or no. However, sometimes you have, um, you are a difficult task to decide where, how far you should get in this, in the, such a stage. Of course we would say, to the staging, you will, prior to do any further staging, you need a biopsy. And most of uh, our, let's say most of us would prefer to do it on a local anesthesia in an office-based manner. However, if you have a tumor like here, for instance, if you do it, let's say, in your office, it costs, a lot, let's say, it causes a lot of discomfort to the patient. And then you have to think twice whether you have really reliable material, enough material, and if in your office it starts to bleed, then you're, let's say, eventually in a big trouble, especially if it starts to bleed heavily, like in this chondroblastic osteosarcoma. We rather prefer to go for a biopsy under general anesthesia, similar to the group of Schreiber that I've recently dis uh, published this data, because they came to the conclusion that under general anesthesia you have one a reliable material, and you can evenly send it for frozen section to the pathologist to know whether the material is really of good quality. And then we use this time for waiting for, of the patho uh, for the pathologist to explore the orbit, whether it is really infiltrated, yes or no, especially in these cases when it is not 100% sure on the, let's say, on the imaging. And of course, if it starts to bleed, that's not, that's not really a problem to manage on surgery. Of course, general anesthesia or other side effects that you have. We propose to make a sort of a grading system in, on the staging, um, on the level of the staging. As I mentioned here, this is a patient with a, with a carcinoma here that has, but you are not sure whether the orbit is really infiltrated, yes or no. So on imaging, it was not infiltrated and taking the biopsy also on surgery was not, let's say on biopsy, it was not infiltrated. Grade B is clearly, that's the case that we, I showed before. On imaging, you got the impression that the periorbit is infiltrated. However, on biopsy, it was not. And C, of course, if there is an infiltration of the periorbit, clearly, this is a grade C. And D, we do not have to discuss because the orbital fat and sometimes even the muscles are infiltrated. So what to do with R1 re uh, resection? We have here a recurrence of a squamous cell carcinoma that has been treated with radiotherapy primarily came back to us, was referred to our institution, and you see there is a squamous cell carcinoma here. And then, shall we go for a orbital accentuation here for a more radical surgery, sacrificing the dura here as well? That's a difficult task. So, 
we would be quite reluctant to go for a further surgery in that stage because one, it is a recurrence. Number two, you only, with surgery, you achieve a just one uh, or one resection. Same is true also for the dura in difficult areas like in this uh, very rare tumor which is also in contact with the internal carotid artery. Of course, you can go for surgery in, in this uh, particular case and you can remove the entire tumor. However, this is an R1 resection. So on summary, we would say there are some arguments whether you can sacrifice, whether you should be reluctant to sacrifice the orbit. And this is, of course, if you just have an R1 and an R2 resection, we also think that more than N1, I even would say we will not discuss it in a patient with, uh, uh, with uh, positive lymph nodes in the uh, local regional area, especially, let's say, in the neck. And of course, in distant metastasis, it does not make sense to us to sacrifice the orbit. And of course, you have to have the clear in a clear infiltration of the orbit. That's no, uh, absolutely mandatory. And in aggressive tumors, we would rather go, if it is possible to resect it entirely, we will go for a, um, an orbital accentuation. I thank you for your attention.